Welcome back everybody to another Motobob video and we're here at Motorcycle Live, our favourite bike show in the UK and we've just popped over to the Honda stand for a look at their new bikes for 2025. Lots of updates and new developments. So here we go with everything that you need to know ahead of the new model year. So look, we'll go in order of capacity ascending. So we'll start with the new 350, which is the GB350 RS, which we covered a couple of weeks back at EICMA. This one or some kind of variant of it has been on sale in in Asia for a while now, the CB350s. But for 2025, this particular model is now gonna be available in the UK and in Europe. Good news, I reckon, because it's a really nice looking bike. They've absolutely nailed the sort of retro styling. And for me, I think it's probably one of the best looking bikes in the segment now. Better looking, I'd say, than the Enfield and maybe even the Triumph Speed 400. As for the build, well, it sort of all fits the retro aesthetic. It's got a traditional steel cradle frame, fairly simple suspension with that right way up fork, the twin shocks at the back and a single disc up front, along with a 19 inch front wheel that gives it a little bit more of that retro look. Then for the engine, it's a 350 single. It doesn't make a heck of a lot of power. It's about 20 horsepower. But look, it all suits the style of the bike. And I think the riding experience is going to be authentic. And so definitely want to consider if you like the idea of the Enfield or the Triumph, but you know, you're a fan of the Honda badge. As for price, well, it's really competitive at just under four grand. It starts at 3,949. And the only thing I wish they'd done is maybe offered some more exciting colors. You can get it in black, of course. Then there's this Puko blue, they call it, and also a mud gray. But for me, the blue and the gray look remarkably similar. And so it might have been nice to have a red or a British racing green or something like that. Over to the 500s now, and we've got a couple of little tweaks for the Rebel 500 and the CL500, including a few new colorways. And I've got to say, this Rebel 500 behind me with the gold wheels is looking rather fine. On top of that, both get tweaks to the engine to make them Euro 5 Plus or 5B compliant. Those are the new emissions regulations that are coming into play soon. So a lot of the bikes at the show this year have had a little update to make sure they pass. But on top of that, you've got a slightly revised seat in position on the Rebel 500. They've moved the bars a tiny bit as well, so potentially a little more comfortable than the previous generation. And also they've sorted out the inverted LCD dash, which was a bit tricky to see in bright light before, as is often the case, to be honest, with inverted LCDs. And so they've made it a bit more contrasty and punchy, so it should be easier to see how fast you're going when it's sunny. The CL500 Scrambler, on the other hand, well, this is in yellow now, as you can see behind me. So that looks nice and punchy. And this one also gets the upgraded seat foam, so potentially a bit more comfort. And they've redesigned the foot pegs as well. I can't quite remember when I went on the launch whether they were particularly an issue, but this bike behind me has some nice, big, flat, grippy, scrambler-style off-road inspired foot pegs that should give you good levels of purchase, even when it's wet or muddy. So look, some minor tweaks for both, but those comfort things do start to creep in after a couple of hours in the saddle, so it's good to see them incorporating some customer feedback into these mid-cycle updates. Now we'll move on to the 750s, and behind me we've got the CB750 Hornet, with which the XL750 Transalp also shares an engine and platform. And from what I can gather, these have both been great sellers since they were introduced a year or two back, because they've got great performance, good features, competitive tech packages as well, and all offered at some of the best pricing points in their particular markets. But having tested both these bikes, I've got to say, one of the only things that was a little bit disappointing was the styling at the front end, with both having a headlight that felt like it was inherited from a bike lower down in the lineup. So the CB750 Hornet looked a bit like the CB500 Hornet, and the Transalp looked a bit like the CB500X. And I guess I wasn't the only person to feel like this, because it's something that they seem to have addressed for 2025, with both of them getting a new headlight amongst other tweaks. Now you'll see on the Hornet behind me, they've given it a bit of a wider headlight. It's not something you'll see on other bikes in the lineup, so maybe they've tried to give it its own personality. And I think I quite like it. It's certainly better than the first generation, but as always, I say looks are subjective, so I'd love to know what you think of it down in the comments below. Now the Transalp, on the other hand, well, they've kind of turned the headlight up a bit at the top corners, and I think it gives it more of the baby Africa twin look that this bike has deserved since it launched. For me, this one's definitely a success, along with the new grey paint job that you can see for 2025 with some yellow accents, gold on the rims. I like this one a lot. And I should also point out that both bikes have got slightly revised suspension settings for 2025, where they've tried to give them a bit more 
comfort, but also better handling at the same time. It's the fork settings, I believe, that are being revised. And so maybe some slight improvements there, but mainly down in the comments, I just want to know what you think of these new headlights. But before we get onto the next bike, I just want to say a massive thanks to Cardo for supporting the channel and sponsoring this video. Now to make use of some of these TFT displays that open up connectivity and the ability to control your phone, you're also best off having a Bluetooth headset so you can pipe the music and phone calls straight into your lid. We recommend Cardo as the best in the business and we use both their PackTalk Edge and PackTalk Pro, which are two of their leading flagship products and both offer excellent sound quality courtesy of their JBL design speakers, brilliant noise gating so you don't get any annoying wind noise in the mic and also their dynamic mesh communication system which gives you the best connection you can get with up to 15 riders on a group ride and a mile between each. Now specifically the PackTalk Pro also offers crash detection which I think is a great peace of mind so you can set a contact and if it detects that you've had an off, it'll alert them immediately. And so I'd say if you want the most fully featured and advanced comms unit on the market, then it's certainly the one to go for. Do check out the links down in the description below to find out more. And once again, a massive thanks to Cardo for their support and also helping us to cover the shows and bring you all the best new bikes. Now also receiving updates and also 750 is the NC750X, but this is a slightly different engine that's longer stroke and more so built for mid-range and usable torque as opposed to top end peaky revy power it's a really practical bike a big seller a great commuter it's got a storage compartment up where the tank would be it holds its weight really nice and low as well so it's very easy to manage and new for 2025 well you'll notice it's got an updated styling package which they say they've intended to make a little more aggressive and adventure inspired on top of that they've made some of the new panels from a material called dura bio and that's one of the steps they're taking to make their bikes more sustainable you'll see that across some of the the other bikes in the lineup as well but perhaps more meaningful to owners is the fact that it now gets a five inch full color tft display which opens up the ability to control menus and have different themes and manage your rider raids and modes as well as some connectivity functionality so you can control music media calls and stuff like that as well as turn by turn nav as for the chassis well it's largely the same but you do now get twin discs up front so it's got two two-part axially mounted nissan calipers on 296 mil discs and i should also point out that this bike is available with their DCT or dual clutch transmission which allows you to ride it as an automatic and this is another area in which they've sought to make a few improvements. It's a brilliant system that's been around for some time but one of the more tricky parts of using DCT is low speed maneuvers because you don't have a clutch to slip so you've got to do it all on the throttle and it can mean U-turns and things like that are just a little bit nerve-wracking at times. So across some of the bikes in their lineup they've updated the clutch, they've given the throttle some new settings for lower speeds and so the idea is it's easier to control and also smoother to come to a stop and pull away so yeah definitely looking forward to testing this one out and seeing if any of those improvements have done the trick and there's no pricing on this one as yet but it was previously for 2023 really quite aggressive so 6,999 for the standard bike and just 7,799 for the DCT version so that being one of the biggest strengths of this bike I wouldn't expect them to change it a great deal it'll probably creep up a little bit but ultimately still be really quite competitive. Now on pretty much the same engine so it sort of shares a platform we've also got the XADV 750 which is a slightly oddball sort of adventure inspired scooter but I've got to say having ridden the previous generation a couple of years back it really is impressive and another very practical bike. I don't think it's a huge seller in the UK but it's very very popular in Europe. This one gets some of the same tweaks so the DCT improvements it should feel a little more refined. It also gets the 5 inch full colour TFT display the new switch gear but they've also made some tweaks to the comfort with again some revised seat padding they've also made the windscreen five step adjustable and this one now gets cruise control as standard now it's interesting that the nc doesn't get that but maybe that's as a result of the really competitive pricing on that model styling has also been updated they've generally just sharpened it up a little bit but also moved the indicators into the daytime running lights there so it's nice and clean at the front end and so look it's not a complete revolution for this bike it's more of a continuation of what made it all already popular but that means I'd fully expect it to continue to be a popular seller out in Europe and maybe a few more people here in the UK might consider it but moving on to what I think might be 
some of the most popular bikes on the stand, if not the whole show. We've got the CB1000 Hornet and the SP version as well. Now, basically this bike follows on from their CB1000R, which was a little bit retro inspired and it takes a lot of the same rudiments. It's got the 150-ish horsepower, 1000cc inline four that's five blade derived, a similar chassis, similar riding position. Some of the tech looks to be carried over as well. And you've even got the Showa suspension and the radial four pot Nissan brakes on this base model. But thing is, they've tried to go down a more competitive pricing route by stripping back the finish to make it a little more simple. And so you'll notice that some of the more fancy and intricate embellishments like the single sided swing arm and that beautiful rear wheel have made way for slightly simpler components. Thing is though, it's done the job. This one comes in at 8,999 pounds, which is, it's gotta be said, really phenomenal value for money. And if you put it up against other naked bikes on the market, like the GSX S1000 from Suzuki, the MT-09, the Z900 from Kawasaki, it's basically one, two, three grand cheaper than all of them. And it seems to offer just as much performance. Now, obviously we're gonna have to wait to ride one to see if it truly is any good. But on paper, this looks like it's gonna be a hot seller in 2025. Perhaps even more tempting though, is this SP version, which is just a thousand pounds more, yet gets some really significant upgrades. So one of them is the fact that it gets an exhaust control valve, and that opens up in the upper part of the rev range, which means that it can breathe a little bit freer the engine and gives it an extra couple of horsepower and a few newton meters of extra peak torque too. Then you've got the Olin shock at the rear instead of the Showa on the standard bike. And also the Nissin brakes make way for what you'd normally consider to be quite premium Brembo Stalama brake calipers. So potentially a slightly crisper feel at the lever, better ride quality on the shock at the rear. And it's all wrapped up in this fantastic looking paint scheme of matte black with gold on the graphics and gold on the rims. I really like the way this bike looks. And I reckon it's got to be the new benchmark for a sub 10,000 pound bike. Now with the 1100 lineup, I'd say the Africa Twin is like the main bike and that's had a bunch of updates for 2024, including a bit of extra torque and mid range and also those DCT refinements that we we're talking about earlier that seem to have been rolled out across the entire Honda lineup. But for 2025, some of these updates now trickle down to some of the other 1100 bikes like this, the NT1100 and also the Rebel 1100. So yeah, more mid range, more torque, better DCT. And also this model now gets a six axis inertial measurement unit that feeds lean angles into the ride arrays. So they should be a little bit more refined in their operation. And it also contributes to that DCT refinement because it can tell when the bike's banked over. And so maybe delay shifting so it doesn't unsettle the bike when you're mid corner. On top of that, you now get the option of their electronic suspension, the semi-active system that was previously available on the Africa Twin or something similar anyway. And I think it will perfectly suit this genre of bike where it's built for, you know, mainly touring and commuting and stuff like that. But also it is capable of a little bit of back row fun. And so a very versatile suspension system that you can change at the touch of a button is gonna go down very nicely, I think. More than that though, there were some practical issues with this bike. It's really good value for money, a good performer, but the first generation of it just had some little oversights, like the fact that it came with side cases as standard, which is, you know, I think great value, a brilliant inclusion, but they were slim and narrow, and that meant you couldn't fit a helmet in them, so you'd have to pay for the big top box if you wanted somewhere to stash your lids. But look, for the new model year, they have widened them out a bit so they can take a lid in each side, they say. But the big one for me was the fact that the adjustable windscreen on the previous gen, you could only really do it if you jumped off the bike and did it with both hands from the front. It was really stiff. There was no adjuster in the cockpit and it just meant that it was a little bit impractical and didn't really suit what is meant to be a practical bike. New for 2025, it's now five step adjustable with a single hand so you can do it on the move. And so yeah, another good example of Honda listening to customers. So like I say, some of these tweaks also get applied to the Rebel 1100 for 2025. More torque, better DCT. They've also revised the riding position so they've improved the comfort in terms of the seat. The bars have been moved back a little bit. The foot pegs have been moved forward. And I think they say that that's to better accommodate taller riders. So if you were thinking of buying one of these, maybe you demoed one, but didn't find it that comfy and you are on the taller end of the spectrum, then maybe it is now worth a second look. And this one also gets now the five inch full color TFT display with all of the extra functionality that that entails. They've also moved the USB port up to the cockpit rather than under the seat. So it's now on the side of 
of the dash, which makes much more sense for charging your phone if you've got it mounted on the bars. And this one comes in three flavors now, so you've still got the base model, you've got the Tour Edition as well with the side cases and the Batwing fairing, but also they've added this new SE variant, which has got a brilliant sort of burnt orange paint job, gold rims and some extra bits of fancy hardware like the fly screen and little bits of finishing here and there. And I think it's easily the best looking Rebel 1100 they've made. I guess they've done it to try and appeal to more of that Americana sort of custom cruiser kind of vibe. And look, it's realistically never going to compete with a Harley or Indian on style alone, but it's certainly closer now to that kind of image. So look, lots of interesting new tweaks for the new model year for their production bikes, but also I should mention they've been quite active over the past few weeks in terms of new tech and concepts. One of the things I did want to show you here, but I can't because they don't have it, is their new V3 engine, which was shown at Eichmo in Milan. And we did have a chance to have a quick look at it, although it didn't get time to make a proper video. But it really does sound like an interesting new development. They chose a V3 for this engine to make it nice and slim and compact, especially at the rear there. It's going to be very slender between the rider's legs. But also it's got an air compressor up on the top of the engine there. And they say that forced induction helps to boost torque right across the rev range, so it should give it proper good performance. Now, a V3 is rather unusual. I believe they've used one in the past, but of course, there's nothing like that on the market at the moment. So I'd be very interested to see what that feels like out on the road. And I believe it is going to make it to a production model. So imagine something like an Africa Twin with a V3. I think that'd be very nice indeed. And maybe it'll have some of the feel of something like Triumph's T-Plane Triple, where it is a three-cylinder bike, but it's got some of the snarl of like a V-Twin. One of the concepts that did make it here, though, is this, the new EV Fun. And look, Honda have been very clear that they want to start building a lot of electric bikes in the next few years. And so this could be a bit of a preview of what's going to be available in the not-too-distant future. Up until now, they've really been focusing on concepts and bikes that are more so geared around urban mobility in the electric segment anyway. And so they're really built to be efficient and easy to charge and small and light and agile and cheap to produce, I guess. This EV Fun though, well, this is meant to be a recreational, proper, sporty motorcycle just with an electric drivetrain. And I think on first impressions, it does look like quite a lot of fun. Now they haven't released any performance figures or range or charging times or, you know, power data or anything like that, but it's just the overall look of it. And the fact that they fitted it out with some sporty looking brakes, some decent looking suspension, the single sided swing arm, you know, that just catches the eye and makes me think that is actually a bike I'd rather like to try out. For me, it's the most exciting looking electric concept since the Triumph sort of R&D project bike a few years back, but potentially Honda have got the resources to make this one a production reality, and I'd certainly be first in line to give it a go. So there we go, the entire Honda stand at Motorcycle Live, a quick walk around the new bikes, and I'd love to know down in the comments below which was your favorite and what's caught your eye. We'll also put a playlist on the screen now so you can check out all of our videos from here at Motorcycle Live, so do give that a look. We'll be adding to it throughout the next few weeks. And also, if you're not already do hit subscribe so you can see all of those videos as soon as they're published. A massive thanks for watching this one and we'll see you in the next video.